Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change terms and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where playthrough WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. Welcome to this week's edition of the Better Rivals Podcast. My name is Oscar Aparicio, and this week, get your throwbacks on. It's the first 49ers primetime game of the year. The 49ers run game may be shot out of a cannon, depending on who actually plays at tailback. And with me this week, here to tell me how Sam Darnold is stealing touchdowns from my fantasy player, McCaffrey, it's David Newman. Damn right he is. You're damn right. You're just mad. You're just mad because I'm scoring all the points in our Dynasty League. I'm not mad. And I... You, I'm, you I'm could the highest score, point scorer two weeks the high, in a row. You could be the highest point scorer every week this entire season, and you probably still wouldn't catch me in terms of the three-year point total in that league. So I, I really don't care. I so got a simple. ring. I do I think a- it's hilarious that you came on here in, in pre-show on the live stream talking shit, and, uh, <laughs> and then we immediately find out that Sam Darnold vultured a touchdown. So, karma. Hey, you know what? It's okay. We're, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long season. We're here to play 60 minutes of football. We're going to play fast. We're going to play physical. Christian McCaffrey's in the best shape of his life. It's great. We're going to do it. We're going to do it all. Uh, This is our preview of the game against Green Bay Packers. I am super excited about these red throwbacks. I've got two uh, jerseys, one of which I got as a birthday gift, one which is on my wall right now. White throwbacks, correct? No, red throwbacks. We're in red throwbacks? Yes. Shit, I didn't know this. Yes, it is a red throwback game. This is a home game. It, dude, if you have your better rivals wallpaper, you can see the little squares in red. I know it's home, a it's home, a home game. game. I see it yes. right there. It's on the wallpaper. I got two versions of it. Red um, throwbacks. I got my Steve Young throwback uh, behind me. I got my Jerry Rice throwback that my wonderful wife gave me as a gift for my birthday. It is time. Let's do this. Red throwbacks because honestly, that's my favorite win uh, from, the, from that era. This wasn't the throwback era. This was in 94, but 98. A few years later uh, was uh, the catch, too. It's probably the best one against Packers. I love it. Um, all right, a little bit of spoiler. housekeeping before we get into the preview. Uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll skip over it. We'll get to the fun stuff. But a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Sunday night game means that rather than doing the live stream on Sunday night, we're going to do it on Monday. Uh, mostly because we got kids. I'm not trying to stay up until midnight. <laughs> I got to wake, I gotta up, wake early. up early Monday morning, man. We already pushed this show to the the edges of my bedtime. Um, Correct. As is on a normal day. So like, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So it's going to be a Monday night show and uh, Monday night pod for those on the Patreon and then uh, Tuesday uh, for those not. And then we'll probably do the regular one on, on Thursday as it is. But uh, housekeeping out of the way. Let's get to the show. Um, first, the rundown. One. Debo Samuel leads the league in receiving yards. I don't know how long the Niners are going to have a receiver at the top of the leaderboard in the NFL. It feels like it's been forever since they've been there. You know, just enjoy it while it's there. Enjoy it while you can. I don't know how long it's going to last, but Debo Samuel, we have wide receiver leading the league (laughs) in receiving yards. It's wonderful. I can't imagine it's going to last long. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be short lived, but yeah, absolutely. Enjoy it while it lasts. Um, Debo, who would have thought? Who would have thought that he would be getting that sort of volume? Well, the opportunity matters. It really it is. It's, it, this, that's the takeaway for fantasy in general, is pick people that are going to have a lot of opportunity to score points. And we didn't think Debo was going to have as much opportunity as he has had over the last couple of games. But he's been the featured wide receiver so far, um, and he's made the most of it. And, and that's why he's leading the league in yardage. We'll see how long that lasts. But the 49ers also released D. Virgin. I am not changing the drinking game rule. <laughs> that is way too good. It is the Johnson Virgin rule. It's going to be that way for a long, long time. Uh, but hopefully, D Diver- Virgin has. Could it be the Virgin some- Johnson rule? I think that's how I have it in the drinking game, okay. but I don't know. If it's not, it's okay. We'll tinker, we'll workshop it. It'll be fine. Um, so that rule stays the same. It's going to be awesome. But let's get to the running backs because the Niners are at this point. We thought we had a lot of depth at the running back position. Turns out that depth was going to be tested early on in the season. You've now got new running backs for the 49ers. One is Trenton Cannon. He played one snap last week. He is likely a special teamer, so he will likely suit up and play this week against the Packers. You've got Chris Thompson, who's on the practice squad. He is a third down receiving back who was with Shanahan in Washington. And and then you've got Jacques Patrick. 
And Jacques Patrick is the one who's interesting because he was signed off the Cincinnati Bengals practice squad and he was signed directly to the 49ers 53-man roster. He does not fit the mold of any other running back that the 49ers have right now because his profile is just big. He is a big-ass running back, but a running back that performed decently well in the preseason if you look at his PFF rushing grade. Yeah, he's a big dude. He's just like a, a large human, and uh, he gets going downhill pretty well, and, and he, I think he had a good number of missed tackles uh, across. I think he had like 34 carries uh, or so in the in this preseason, and um, yeah, had a, like a decent number of missed tackles on those, and, and so, yeah, it, it is weird that, you know, he is nothing like it, it it's not just like the let's grab the next small fast guy right like off the the production line here like it's just um a little interesting yeah that they would go for a player like this because this is even i i feel like he's even physically much bigger than like trey sermon even like i haven't actually looked that up and and know what their their actual size is but just looking at him uh on the snaps that we watch like yeah it, it's he's a large dude so it's it's gonna be a little weird seeing him there I looked him up on the relative athletic score website um, that is run by at math bomb on Twitter. Definitely check it out. It is basically gives you a composite score up to 10 for uh, that person's athleticism. It's a relative athletic score. Um, really intuitive, easy to understand. You know, 10 is the best. One is really low. And, and you look at, at Jacques Patrick physical profile and you think to yourself, OK, the Niners have usually gone after, especially late round flyers that are physically gifted. This is why Raheem Mostert is so good. This is why Elijah Mitchell was so good. This is why, you know, podcast favorite Matt Breida was also very, very good. You look at Jacques Patrick's relative athletic score, and it clocks in at a 2.98. Because basically this dude has got elite size. You know, 6'2", 6'3", 226 pounds. But everything else is not great. Everything Like his bench press is not big. His 40-yard his dash was about 4.69. His 10-yard split was 1.65. Um, he's not super agile, but when you watch him on film, it, you, I mean, you can tell it takes him a while to get up to speed, but he uses his bigness because it doesn't look like anyone really tackles him. It looks like he just chooses to fall. And, and it's the most ridiculous thing. I laughed audibly for probably the first three minutes of us watching film where it's like, it just, it's just hilarious. It just looks like he chooses to sit down and that's why he ends up the, like ends the run. I mean, we've really exhausted all I have to say about this backup running back who's played a, a small number of preseason snaps. So, yeah, I mean, he's large. He's maybe going to get some snaps. Let's hope that Trey Sermon is uh, available, who is apparently on a, quote, good path to play on Sunday, which I think would which be is, a good thing. It's good because his I didn't I haven't seen a head bounce that often midair before hitting the ground, I think. Uh, I don't know. I don't know ever maybe watching football. So glad he is on a path to play and it'll be good if he gets some snaps. Yeah. Thursday uh, is when we're recording today. Elijah Mitchell did not practice. Not a good sign if you're not practicing Thursday. Um, so he may be shut down this week, which means that it may be a backfield led by Trey Sermon and Jacques Patrick. Last thing in the rundown from the research department, something we'll be keeping track of is just the pressure rate. The 49ers are getting because it's something they've predicated their defense on and something that I think is interesting. And so we thought, well, let's take a look. So far this season, the 49ers have generated pressure on 45.2% of dropbacks. That's good for fourth in the NFL. That's really good. Their strategy is working. Now, in the checking in on, on D'Amico Ryans and his strategic tendencies, their overall blitz rate so far this season, 21st in the league, just at 24%. So a little below average. Their blitz rate on first and second down, though, is 22nd. Their blitz rate on third down, which is something Robert Sala was known for, jumps all the way up to 40%, which puts them fifth in the NFL. The highest blitzer on third down in the NFL, still Robert Sala with the New York Jets. So interesting that he is keeping some of those tendencies still with the 49ers defense and Robert Sala continues to be Robert Sala. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes, I mean, it's still early, certainly, and, and we have plenty of time to see you know, if if D'Amico Ryans is going to put more of a his own stamp on this defense and, and kind of depart from things that Sala did. But I, I think it was always likely, especially in this first season, that he was just going to kind of continue what they had been doing, right? They, they have uh, a lot of the same guys that have been there for several seasons and, you know, the ones that are new or, or 
like more bit players and, and less important players, right? They have that kind of core group of defenders that, who have been there and I think are comfortable in the system. And, and it makes sense to keep them doing what they've been successful with. And I think that's kind of the way we've seen them go through the first two games. And um, yeah, I, I think that's what I would expect them to do throughout the season, at least for you know, the first half of the season here, um, as they kind of like get into it. And then we can, you know, kind of go from there, depending on how things are going, where they're at injury wise, what adjustments they need to make all, all of that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, it, it's been nice to see them get pressure back. I don't think they're fully back in terms of the quality of those pressures. Like I, I think, you know, it, it's not quite as dominant as it was say during, you know, the 2019 season, but, um, certainly better than than what they had last year, I think. And what in your mind would make them quality pressures? Just the speed at which the pressure comes? Yeah, so I, I think when you're looking at, at pressures, right, it, it's the same reason when you look... Uh, so if, you, if you're ever like looking um, on PFF premium stats and you see somebody that has like a high pass rushing productivity, right, and his pass rush grade may not be very well, very good, um, or at least more middle of the pack. So they don't line up necessarily in the same general area. I think you're looking at a, a guy, right, that is getting pressures, which is still good. It's a, it's a positive thing, but the quality of those pressures aren't as good. So he's not getting them as quickly. You know, he's not um, putting that pressure on early in the down. And so I think, and it usually has to do with like less clean wins against the offensive linemen, you know, things like that. So uh, I think that's what we're seeing from them as a team largely. Like they, they definitely you know, obviously have had some snaps where things have been very good and uh, and they get there quickly. But I think largely they, they haven't been, that hasn't been like a high number of their pressures, right? Where they're getting it there quickly and, and really forcing the quarterback to get the ball out of his hands very fast. I think it's just kind of been a situation where it's like, yeah, they're, they're getting there. And, um, you know, if they hold on to the ball a little bit too long, like they're going to have to deal with that defensive line, but it hasn't been to the same level. I feel like as it was in, in that 2019 season, no team can afford to overpay for talent, build a championship team with indeed the smart way by only paying for quality candidates that meet your must have requirements. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in one place, even interviewing. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed knows how important it is to make the most of your recruiting hours and dollars. With Indeed, you can save time and money by setting your must-have qualifications and only paying for the quality candidates that meet them. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through October 31st. Terms and conditions apply. The defense, though, so far has been performing overall pretty well. This was always going to be a question with a new defensive coordinator and some new pieces. And now they get their first test from a team that it turns out is not dead after all. And that's going to be the Green Bay Packers. They came back and beat the Lions in a resounding fashion. Did not let the Lions climb back into that game, unlike the 49ers. And, and now it is time for the real first test of the season to begin. This opens up a stretch of games where the Niners are going to face the Packers, the Seahawks, and then the Cardinals in Arizona before they hit their bye. And we're going to start the preview, not with the Packers, but with the 0-16 Lions. Because when you look at this preview first, you think to yourself, why are we talking about the Lions? Again, we just beat them, and the Packers beat them. Why? It's because their defensive coordinator was Joe Barry the season that they went 0-16. And he is currently the defensive coordinator for the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, the, prob- the point is, his defense sucks. It sucked then, and it sucked now. All I'm trying to say well, is he's terrible. Suck. And he doesn't deserve this job. No, I don't. Know. Uh, well, he may deserve the job, but at least for one more week, so the Niners can actually get through him and get. Look, through the he defense. had to. He had to claw his way back. You're right. After that defensive coordinator stand on the Lions, he fell back to linebackers coach. Then he fell back to a linebackers coach in college, uh, and then he had to come back. Chargers linebackers coach again, and then finally, 2015, 2016, Washington football team. We get back to that DC spot. So. 
But you look at the Packers defense so far, and that Packers defense might have some issues, both because of injury and both because of uh, how they've been playing so far. It's a defense that is, if you're thinking of the Niners offense, if it can get back to how it was playing against the Lions, this could be a game where, you know, maybe Aaron Rodgers has to try to keep up with the Niners offense as opposed to thinking it has to happen the other way around. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a matchup that largely uh, could be very good for the 49ers offense. I mean, I, I think when you look at some of the areas that the Packers defense has struggled specifically against the pass, right? I, I think um, there have been some interesting things there uh, with, with kind of how they have um, been able to defend. Um, and some of them, I mean, the, the stats are really bad, and, and we looked at some of the plays, and it, it wasn't um, unfortunately quite as bad as I think some of those early numbers would lead you to believe. Like, for instance, right now they're the worst team in the NFL defending the pass um, against play action. And, and so according to EPA per play with that, um, but when you you look at, at the plays that they face play action, it's not like they're giving up necessarily a ton of big chunk yardage they gave up a few big plays uh in in the saints game specifically there was one you know big shot play that they had for like a 50 plus yard touchdown um and then there was another like you know 20 yard throw or so that they had on a deep out route but it, it's not like they've just been getting carved up in the middle of the field and um you know in in, the, in their linebackers and safeties have been doing a really poor job things that would lead you to believe that the 49ers can really you know take advantage and, and kind of, uh, you know, go after them and play action. Not to say that they won't find any success there. The 49ers find ways to create that space against just about everyone, but that's not been the Packers defense MO so far, but they've struggled against screens. They've struggled against, you know, they've had some struggles against play action. Um, and, and just generally, I think the pass their linebackers aren't very good. Um, and I think the, the corner specifically opposite Jair Alexander, whether that's Kevin King or whoever's kind of been over there, um, that's kind of been the area that you can attack. Yeah, and this isn't a when you think of defensive fronts that have given the 49ers trouble. I mean, the the, the Eagles gave the 49ers trouble, and, and you knew that was going to happen with the the quality of their defensive line. I don't think the Packers have a defensive line that's quite that's quite that good. They do have Preston Smith, who's playing well, and and Kenny Clark, but I think after that, it's going to be a, not a lot of people who are going to do very very good things. And and you think to yourself the. Okay, the Niners offensive line has now finally got some stability with Alex Mack in the the middle of that offensive line. And I don't think Alex Mack has been a world beater kind of like, oh, my God, he's you know, his career is surging back into the elite centers of the NFL. But he has been there and he hasn't been a liability, which I think just being there is one thing because the Niners center is basically the problem has been that he hasn't been there. <laughs> it's like, yeah. so you could never yeah. have them be good, even if they performed well. And, and I do think that he is, is not just there and he is stable and he's provided some stability, but his pass protection is actually holding up. Okay. And I think at this point in his career, he's probably going to be a little bit better pass protector than he is going to be able to get out on some of the run blocks that he's got to make as a center in Shanahan scheme. So the simple fact that he can play at a good level and be consistent and actually play is a win for the 49ers. And so you look at the centers, finally stabilized. The defensive front for the Packers is not nearly as fearsome as maybe they saw in Philadelphia. And now you're talking about Jimmy Garoppolo, who's probably going to have a little bit more time and, and start to actually get the ball in the air and maybe do some wonderful things against the defense that's coordinated by a dude who is not known for his defensive prowess. Yeah, I mean, especially when you consider that that their best pass rusher, right, on on a unit that already like wasn't, I don't, I want, I don't want to say it's bad. Like they have some decent players up there. Both the Smiths are are pretty solid. Kenny Clark in the middle, but um, yeah, I, I think it it certainly isn't like the same quality, right, that Philly was last week, for instance. But um, so I think you look at yeah, their their best pass rushers at area Smith not available um certainly hurts them and then yeah I, I think when you get into how the 49ers can attack them like I mentioned with the play action stuff a little bit there the outside is really more where they got attacked and I think if as we kind of transition to looking at Brandon Ayuk a little bit and and kind of how he's been utilized so far this season I think it's possible that that this could be a game that aligns well with what he's been doing so far it's just kind of a matter of whether Jimmy Garoppolo is going to throw it right throw it to those routes to those type of looks because he has spent a lot of time on the outside running more outside type routes more vertical routes 
Um, and so the Packers defense has been vulnerable against that type of thing, but whether or not we see Jimmy Garoppolo target that stuff is, is another story. 43% of Brandon Ayuk's routes this season have been vertical routes. And in a lot of those, it's unlikely that he would be targeted because it's pretty clear that he is, well, the clear out route where he's running someone off or he's basically doing the thing on the, the play sheet where it's like, maybe there's an alert if you're lucky, but by and large, just running straight and trying to clear out a couple of things. And that's basically what he's been doing. So when people are asking like, what's happened to Brandon Ayuk, it's not only a reduced number of snaps. It's not only splitting snaps with Trent Sherfield. It's also not being featured in the concepts that Shanahan is calling. He's either clearing things out or he's on the backside of concepts. And in some cases, he's not even like looking for the ball because he knows he's either not really in the progression or it's going to be unlikely for him to get to the progression. And and one of the times that he was finally featured against Philly, I think the, the ball gets airmailed early in the game against Philadelphia. And and even his ridiculous go-go gadget arms can't get that ball uh, any, or can't get anywhere near the ball. So it, it's going to be interesting to see if, especially given how the Saints attacked Green Bay's defense, whether or not there will be more of a vertical element and whether or not Brandon Ayuk is going to actually get some targets on those vertical routes. Right, yeah. So I think it can go one of two ways, right? Either if they continue to utilize him in the same manner that they have, which is... Again, like you mentioned, a, a lot of clear out stuff, a lot of vertical routes, a lot of outside routes. Um, if, if they continue to do those things, I think he'll have some opportunities. It hasn't been like he's not getting open, right? So on, on routes where uh, it, that there is the potential for him to see the ball, I mean, it's it's not like he's just getting blanketed out there. So I, I don't really think it's an issue with him, at least from what we can see in games, right? So again, what, whatever's going on at practice that may have Shanahan pissed off at him or not, um, is is kind of a secondary thing, but it is in terms of what we can see from the snaps that he's going out there on game day and, and running routes. Like, I don't think the issue is him not you know not being able to get open. There there just wasn't a lot of that that we saw um, in in the routes run that he has so far. So I, I think it's usage just not being put in in the position to uh, be the targeted guy, right? To be the primary target on the that concept. Um, and then when he is the few times, I mean, I think across like 30 something routes run so far in these two games, there were maybe, I forgot to to mark it down, but it was like four or five times where you would look at that play and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's the primary target based on where Jimmy's looking after the the snap and and kind of the route that he's running and and what the other routes are around him, right? Where it just makes sense that that's going to time up to be the the main guy that he's going to be looking at there so yeah i i think he just isn't being put in those spots so when you look at it how they could get him involved if that is going to be something that's a priority you can either one keep him doing some of these things uh, you know on the outside on the vertical stuff that the packers have struggled to defend and just throw him the ball on those and and kind of make more of a concerted effort um to to target those type of routes or you need to to start mixing things up more with him and Debo, right? It's it just been Debo is in the spot right now that is being featured heavily on almost every single drop back, right? If it's not a, a Kittle play, if it's not something where we're looking to get the tight end involved, Debo is the guy running the primary route, and he's just the first look on so many of these drop back passes, um, and, and that's why he's getting such a heavy target load, right? And, and so you, you either need to start mixing that up if you want to get Ayuk the ball, um, or he's just going to continue to be what he's been right now, which is mostly a decoy, mostly not involved in the offense. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how Ayuk is utilized. If there is a game to begin to utilize Ayuk, I, I feel like this is it. Just because of the opponent, because of the the potential susceptibility to some of these deeper shots, um, and and we may even see Trey Lance come in and try a deep shot. Like that wouldn't surprise me either. If if you are going to try and attack them deep, maybe this is the game where you bring in Trey Lance, and it's no longer a, a run, which is what they'll expect. Um, but it's going to be a deep shot to someone like Ayuk. It's just the two week setup to a week three explosion. That's all it is. He's just <laughs> he's playing rope a dope. With uh, with Brandon Ayuk, he's like just run clear out routes, run clear out routes, run, and then we're gonna put in Trey Lance for two snaps. I know that's not what's happening, but the optimist in me is trying to find something, some method to the madness, because the best wide receiver on the team in terms of talent, um, and the most talented wide receiver that Shanahan has drafted, he is now basically put on the shelf, and instead, you know, we're we're over here talking about Trent Sherfield and Mohamed Sanu, but. 
Let's get to the 49ers secondary because they, there were some questions against the secondary against Philadelphia. They rose to the occasion, and now they may be getting some reinforcements because Emmanuel Mosley may be playing in this game. He may finally be healthy, but who starts or, or who sits if Emmanuel Mosley is healthy? I feel like if he's healthy, right, you have to assume that Mosley's going to come in and take one of those spots. And and yeah. so at that point, right, you're talking Josh Norman or uh, which we got corrected on this. We've been saying it shocker. We've been saying a name wrong the entire time. It's not Lenoir, right? It's Lenoir. Got Lenore. it. I'll remember so, that for the 30 seconds it will take me to finish uh, this thought. And then I will forget it and continue to say it wrong. Lenoir. Lenoir. Lenore. Lenore. No. Uh, Lenore. Eleanor. Dora. I, th- I think, um, so I, I think between those two, it, it's tough because I, I, Norman Wright clearly has some ability and I think like he's played very well in the past and, and I think he looked solid is, is, you know, when you factor in the full context of his, uh, having to be out there in the first place last week. Right. Um, and so, like, I can understand why they would go with him. Um, but I do think, like, Lenoir has been playing. God damn it, I already did it. Lenoir has been, <laughs> <laughs> has been uh, playing very well um, in, in these two games. And I think, like, uh, you know, he's had the, the one huge slip up last week, like, literal slip up and, and allowed that 90 plus yard. Um, you know, play against Philly there. But other than that, when you look at him on a snap to snap basis, I think he's been very good and, and deserves to be out there. And so um, it wouldn't shock me considering just the 49ers. I feel like they like to go more veteran player than young player if, if given the opportunity. And, and so uh, that makes me think that maybe they'll lean Norman, but um, I, I don't know that I'm convinced that Norman can hold off Lenore long-term. Yeah, the only I do think the coaching staff is a little bit more conservative when it comes to vet versus rookie, but I I can't see how you end up choosing Norman at this point. Lenore has played very very well. He's earned his shot. The only thing I can think of is maybe it's a size thing with the size of the Green Bay wide receivers. Maybe you think to yourself a bigger corner would be a little bit better because Lenore, despite his good coverage ability, is not the biggest corner in the whole wide world. And maybe you think about. But then at that point, maybe just put them in, in the red zone, right? Put the bigger corners in, in the red zone if you're worried about something like that or the fades or the back shoulders or, or, or that. Because I think when you're looking at, at that corner, I think Lenore at this point is playing well enough that he has earned the right to basically be the unquestioned starter at corner. And if Mosley's your other guy and you think he's good enough to start, I think it's got to be Norman, the guy who, ha- who only started one game and, and the guy who at this point, while he played well, is at this point in his career hopefully going to be a depth piece and, or maybe a piece that comes in and plays when the the team when, when the Packers go four wide so I think I think it should be Norman that sits I think it should be Mosley and Lenore and you know we'll see what happens when when the team gets to choose yeah I I, I agree that that's what it should be I'm not convinced that's how it'll end up one surprising stat from the 49ers is that they have only allowed an open target on 44 percent of passes this season that is the sixth lowest in the NFL best in the NFL is the Denver Broncos at 33.3%. The worst, the Indianapolis Colts at 72%. Wow. Not great. 72%. Not Man, I wonder if that great. holds up by the time the Niners get to the Colts uh, in week. What is it? It's like later in the year, right? Where is it? Yeah, check that schedule. Nope, it's Better week off seven. Schedule. Week seven. Um, week seven. Yeah, I, I was uh, like when when researching for this game, like was very surprised when I when I stumbled on that. Like, I, I think it speaks to, yeah, like how well they've been playing. And, and again, it's, you know, it's only two games. And one of the a part of one of those games was really ugly, right? The fourth quarter, that Lions game, when you started putting in some backups, things just kind of uh, fell apart there. But I, I think on the whole, for most of that game, they looked very good. And, and then again, for most of that Philly game, barring basically one big throw, um, they, they've done very well. Um, and I think when you look at the the output that they have, the performance that they have, I think that is um, overperforming the talent and, and the level that you would think that they would play based on the guys in that secondary right now. I mean, it's, it's basically, I think you feel pretty solid about the safeties, right, between Ward and Tart when they're out there. Obviously, Fred Warner is amazing. 
But other than that, it's it's pretty shaky in terms of the guys that they're putting out there for a significant number of snaps in that back seven. So um, I, I think what they've been able to do with that group has been very impressive. So overall, I feel like the way that we frame the preview is that the Niners have a couple of key advantages at some key spots where they like to have advantages. The defensive line, I think on offense, they've got they, they don't have to worry as much about a fearsome front from Green Bay and Green Bay has shown susceptible to be attacked in some ways, whether it be deep that maybe the Niners will try, uh, maybe it's play action. But overall, it seems like we've kind of put this and set this up as a, you know, kind of a very, very winnable game for the 49ers when we're talking about the Packers being a really, really good team. So do you think this is going to be like a, a not necessarily a walk in the park, but a game where you look at it and you're like, yeah, maybe I'm not surprised the Niners won by like 10 points or something like that. Or, or do you think it really is going to be more of the traditional slugfest that the Niners have against Green Bay? I, th- I think uh, defensively, you know, even though just have said kind of all those good things, I think that's the biggest question mark for me. I, yeah, I think it really comes down to two things. I think one is, yeah, defensively, do they hold up now against better competition? I mean, obviously, uh, Rodgers and, and um, the Packers offense in general, when you look at just kind of their overall performance across two games, not a lot of very impressive numbers because that week one was was just terrible. But I, I think that's a situation where like, I mean, Rogers said it himself, right? Like, we're not going to basically get uh, caught up in one shitty performance. Like, yeah, it was bad. It was ugly. Like, but hey, like, we're, we're not going to just, like, dwell on this and and think that we're a terrible team. And I think, like, look, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of evidence that says that Rogers is going to be just fine and that offense is going to be just fine. So I, I expect them to be better than they've been for, you know, the, the first couple weeks here. And I, I think, yeah, it is going to be a bigger test uh for this secondary if they can continue to play at this level i think um the the receivers uh you know with the lions certainly were problematic um and the packers are gonna have better weapons there that they can go to with with philly i think you look more just kind of at the quarterback in the scheme i mean hertz has been good but he doesn't pose the same sort of passing threat that rogers does right i mean rogers is just going to be able to um pick apart every every mistake you make right is is kind of what you should count on and that he's going to be able to find it and take advantage so i think it's a a little bit different animal when you look at the combination of quarterback and and skill position players that they're going to be going up against compared to the first two weeks and and then offensively i think it comes down to like can they continue to uh perform well and get good output with subpar quarterback play um i think looking at the packers defense my I think yes is probably the answer there. I I don't think they need the strongest game from Jimmy Garoppolo in order to have success offensively against that team. Uh, So, yeah, I I think they should be able to put points up on the board. It's just can the defense, uh, again, kind of answer that call and be good enough to slow Rodgers and company down? I thought that the game against the Eagles was going to be a – it could potentially be a high-scoring affair. My mistake was that I forgot how good the defensive line for the Eagles was and how they were going to be able to really make things muddy for the 49ers, especially in the run game. I don't know that the Packers have that same kind of a front. And if they don't have that kind of front and they can't stop up the 49ers run game, then everything else begins to get opened up. And so I think that you look at their performance against tight ends. I think George Kittle's liable to have a good game. I think they're liable to keep things moving and, and keep things on schedule in the run, which means that generally the offense is on schedule. And and that usually bodes well for the 49ers and their offense as a whole. So I think you go into this game more confident on offense, and it really just comes down to whether or not the team can hold Aaron Rodgers down, which, you know, I'm week to week. This point's been a 50 50 <laughs> proposition, right? We'll see. We'll see how it happens and we'll see whether or not D'Amico Ryans can exert the same kind of uh, pressure on, on, on Aaron Rodgers. And, and I do think they'll get some pressure. So that's why I think ultimately the Niners win. I mean, you look at the spread. It's a three and a half point spread. It's actually more than, than it was against Philadelphia because at Philadelphia, I think it was a three point spread. But the Niners are at home. Uh, so they get a little bit of a bump there. And yeah, three and a half points. I, I mean, I don't know if I, I yeah, I think that at this point they probably wouldn't cover. Um, and, and so it's like it's going to be tough, but I think that they'll be able to get some pressure. And uh, and it's going to it's not going to be decided in the third quarter, but I think it'll be a four point game. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's big specifically if if Jenkins can't go right. So I mean, they're already missing Bakhtiari on that offensive line. Jenkins is is the guy that is kicked out from left guard uh, to left tackle to to kind of play that spot, but he didn't practice today. 
So if, if for some reason he isn't there and, and they're really scrambling in, in terms of who they're playing to tackle, yeah, it could be kind of ugly for them up front. Um, I, I do think it'll be interesting to see um, from, I mean, again, again, we've kind of talked about um, D'Amico Ryan's largely sticking so far with, with kind of what Robert Sala did and, and kind of established with that group. And I think one of the things we saw from him, right, was was kind of, uh, they had that core structure there, but they did definitely tweak things week to week based on who they were playing. And, and I think one thing you don't see a lot of teams do is blitz Aaron Rodgers. Um, and, and so they have been, again, like we mentioned, the uh, pretty blitz happy on third down specifically. Um, and, and so I would be interested to see if that continues or if they just go like most teams do and try to go pretty conservative, hope their front four can get after it against kind of a weakened offensive line and, and just not give Rodgers, you know, you, you want to fill all of that space you need to cover, right? You need to fill as much of that as possible with as many defenders as possible uh, and, and hope that you can get after it with four, I think, is is generally the best approach with him. That has to be the move. It has to be the yeah. move that you're going to, especially against the banged up offensive line and D Ford actually being able to play and Nick Bosa playing and Eric Armstead having the season that he is having so far through two weeks. I feel like we probably haven't talked about him enough because he's having a really, really good first couple of weeks, and that has to be a winning formula. You have to be able to rush for and get to Aaron Rodgers and, and cover the back end. I feel like this is not... this. Don't, don't go crazy on blitzes. I think you've got to be able to rush with four and win with four against this offensive line, and I think that may tilt the game. Yeah, I mean, you would hope so, because, it, you know, it, it goes both ways too, right? I, I think, like, if it were... You know, we we talk about this as like you the typical thing is to not blitz Rogers, right? And to not do that because for obvious reasons of Rogers taking advantage of that and being able to diagnose the blitz and, and know where your weak spots are and, and go ahead and make those throws before the rush can get there. Um, but they've also had a, an incredibly good pass protecting offensive line there for um, you know, a number of years. And so that's kind of also the the thing where it's like, all right, are we really gonna you know, maybe we're even wasting sending these extra rushers, not because Roger's going to get a ball out, um, but also because they're probably going to be able to block it up pretty well, right? Or as well as anybody in, in the league. And so you, you wonder, yeah, like, do they start to try to think they can get more aggressive because, uh, you know, they think they can take advantage of some of these weak spots on the offensive line. I don't know. That's probably not what I would do, but yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what Ryan's chooses, how he chooses to approach this game. Well, we will see on Sunday night when uh, the Niners wear their red throwback jerseys and go up against the Green Bay Packers, and we'll have our reaction pod on Monday. We'll be live streaming it for the Patreon folks. We'll post that podcast on Tuesday, um, and we'll be back. We'll see if the Niners can open up their season 3-0 and and keep marching towards uh, that week six bye and stay at pace with the rest of the NFC, because uh, the NFC West specifically, yeah. because at this point, I think... They're gonna have to. They're gonna have to rack up these wins, and this is important. This is a divisional, uh, you know, or a conference win, and th- that conference record may be important when you get later on in the year. So that does it for this week's edition of the Better Rivals podcast. You can always follow me on Twitter, David. Talk about the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Better Rivals. Um, it's been a lot of fun this season. Definitely come join us, buy us a beer, get on that Discord. Um, and, and again, we've been doing, I think, a lot more so far early this season. We have a lot more planned live streams of the pods. You're going to get early access to all that stuff. You're going to get the weekly video breakdowns. Um, and like I said, the Discord's been a lot of fun, especially uh, we had it rolling on, on game day this last week, and it was uh, a good time. So, yeah, come join us. Thanks again for tuning in this week. As always, go Niners. Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where play-through winbet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700.